Today, I will be opening up the vault, some of my vulnerable parts, and expose to you the biggest mistakes that I made as a plant medicine facilitator. If you're wondering, Ivan, why are you doing that? For all of the following reasons. The mistakes I made have hurt people, and they deserve acknowledgement. The mistakes I made are being repeated all over the world, and this could help with that. Many of the mistakes I made were done by imitating those who were supposed to give me proper guidance, but didn't. I would have loved to come across a video like this one, and so I am putting this out there for those who are or will be in a similar position as I was. So in today's video, you will have the chance to take a peek behind the scenes of the darkest parts of my history as a facilitator. So let's get right into it, I guess. Um, no, actually, I changed my mind. No, wait, wait, come back. No, wait, come back. Hi there, I'm Ivan, and in the 10 years that I've been holding ceremonies, I made plenty of mistakes. Hopefully, I made more of those in the beginning years than in the last ones, as that would mean that I learned from them. Those mistakes have hurt people and have hurt myself. I don't like that, and I like even less that those mistakes are being repeated all over the world. They are happening right now as you are watching this. I would like for that to stop, and this is an attempt to play a part on it. If you're a facilitator of any kind watching this, hopefully this should bring some self-reflection to see which of these you might be doing. And if you're a participant also of any kind of healing or spiritual setting, this should hopefully bring some better understanding on what to look out for. So let's dive into our top 10 in ascendant order from bad to worst. Number 10 giving too many ceremonies. When I started serving, I fell in love with what this medicine could do for people. I became passionate about it, and my community grew really quickly around the world. I was being asked to come to many different countries to hold ceremonies, and that sounded so exciting to me. So I would say yes to all of them, and at some point the demand got so big that saying yes to all the ceremonies meant that I was going to be in an airplane every single week. And I did. I couldn't say no. The reasons why I couldn't say no will be described in next point when I talk about understanding one's shadow, something that it is essential to be able to give ceremonies in integrity. So why is this a mistake? Well, because I overdid it. And of course, I burnt out. What started as a passion became a chore. What started as, oh my god, I can't believe that there's another ceremony next week, became Oh God, I can't believe there's another ceremony next week. This is not only bad for myself, but it is also disrespectful toward the participants who are putting their trust in me with what I consider the most important thing to trust somebody with, their healing. For so many people, signing up to a ceremony like this is a really big step and it requires so much bravery and trust. Imagine that then you arrive and your facilitator doesn't even want to be there. How would you feel? The biggest consequence of overcommitting was that I was always exhausted, and that created its own set of consequences. My introductions about what we were about to do had no soul, or my availability to process with people was really low, or I would simply do the minimum required to get through that ceremony. That is not giving the best I could give. That is not the best possible ceremony that I could offer. And therefore, it does not honor the participants' trust in me, and it does not honor my own love for this work. Burning out has forced me to stop and reevaluate my reasons to do this and on how to be more diligent moving forward. Today, the frequency of how often I serve has reduced a lot. I do not want to serve unless I want to be there. That is the best thing that I could do to honor the participants and myself. It feels great to want to be where you are and people can feel it too. It is contagious. That is the best way to give the best possible ceremony that I know how. Number nine, serving medicine before I was ready. I started serving medicine only one and a half years after my first experience. That is way, way too soon. Today, 10 years later, I can understand that perfectly. But back then, I had no idea that that was too soon. If that version of me from a decade ago would ask me for advice today, I would say, Please don't serve medicine yet. You have so much to learn if you really want to serve those people who will come to you. And if you don't care about truly serving, then that's a bigger reason not to do so. So the title of this chapter is Serving Medicine Before I Was Ready, but what does it mean to be ready? And how do you know when you are ready? Well, this is a big topic deserving of its own video, but to summarize it, and based on my experience of seeing what has really helped people and what has harmed them, 
a person needs to go through a thorough understanding of their light and shadowed reasons to serve medicine and then do healing around those shadowed reasons. When people tell me that they want to serve medicine one day, the first question I ask is, why? And 100% of the times, their answers are what I call the light reasons to serve. I was no exception, I did the same thing. Light reasons are those reasons to serve that are genuinely coming from your heart. For example, that you want to help people or you want to assist the world in becoming a better place. And 0% of the times, they mention their shadow reasons. I have yet to meet somebody that when I ask them why they want to serve, they would say something like, because I need validation, because I want to be the person in power, because I am lost and this will be giving meaning to my life, because I want this to be my source of income, etc. And check this out, no facilitator ever serves only from the light. Every single person that you sat or will sit with will have their own set of shadowed reasons to be serving you. And that's okay, there is no need to try to find one without them because you will not. And just because somebody is serving you partially from their shadow does not mean that you are not going to be finding a lot of healing in that ceremony. But it is imperative that every facilitator asks themselves which are their shadow reasons to be doing it and start working directly on healing them until they cross what I call an acceptable threshold in which once you're above it, you will be ready to be serving. Now, healing your shadow is not the only requirement to be able to be ready to serve. There are many others like learning how to deal with deep trauma, skills in leadership, diligence in dosing, basic knowledge of chemistry and the interactions between the medicine, neuroreceptors and pharmaceuticals, learning to see your practice from the spiritual lens as much as from the scientific one and many others. But please, if you are thinking of serving before you're ready, don't. The path ahead of any medicine facilitator is not easy and in many instances you will want to quit. If you start before you are ready, you will make it harder on your participants and on yourself, discouraging them from doing more healing work in the future and maximizing your chances of eventually quitting. Number 8. Having students before I was ready. So I already talked about that I rushed into serving medicine. I also rushed into having students. I guess I'm in a rush. I started teaching others how to hold ceremonies only one and a half years after I started serving, which means three years after my very first experience. That is also extremely soon. And thanks to the mess that this has created, I learned how intricate and delicate the art of serving ayahuasca is and how high the stakes are. Issues like not understanding power dynamics or not giving those people who I was teaching enough time to do healing themselves before diving into a position of power were some of the things that I did not consider back then. So this is what happens next. If the person who is teaching you tells you that you are ready to hold ceremonies, then a wounded part of you that wants to feel important or wants to be in a position of power gets validated. This leads the student to having a harder time realizing that there is a lot more to heal or to admit that they are not ready yet because they are getting the validation from the person that they see as the one that is authorized to give that kind of permission. Another issue is that every student always imitates what their teacher is doing, whether those things are right or not, believing that those are the right thing to do, even if they are not. In this case, they were imitating me doing things that, from this perspective, I know were not okay. This is why it is so important not to teach before you're ready, because when the teacher is being themselves, they become an example of what to do and if the teacher is not ready then they will be spreading an improper way of holding ceremonies simply through imitation and it is imitation one of the main reasons i based myself on deciding to start teaching others i imitated those who i learned from that had many students and would agree to teach anyone who would ask them to learn. So what I learned is that if someone asks, you simply say yes, because the world needs this medicine and the more facilitators, the better. I also didn't know how much one needs to know and how much one needs to heal in order to give proper ceremonies. So it was an awareness spreading itself. Since my own teachers were saying yes to everyone, I thought, well, I guess anyone can do this. Wrong. Most people are not qualified to serve ayahuasca and never will. Throughout this journey, some of the people that I taught have quit. Some are still in process and half of them have become such wonderful facilitators. So even though at the end this is mostly okay, a lot of pain and drama would have been avoided if I would have started teaching much later. How much later? Well, looking back and with the high standards that I have today, 
I would say that I was only ready to start teaching maybe two or three years ago after seven years of facilitation experience. But it is much easier to say that once you have walked the path, right? Back then I might have said that I was ready two years before that after five years of facilitation experience. And maybe back then I would have felt I was ready two years before that. So who knows, maybe in two years I would think that I was completely crazy in believing that at the time of this recording I was ready. There is a disturbing fact, however. There are many ayahuasca centers in Peru that they give what they call an initiation. Those initiations sometimes last a month or a few months, and after that time, they give you their blessing to start holding your own ceremonies. This is absolutely absurd and terrible. Now, if this is their tradition based on where they live and the issues that they have to deal with, great. But holding ceremonies for Westerners cannot be learned in just a few months or even a few years. If you ever hear of someone that had a two-month initiation in the jungle and they say that they are ready to serve medicine, here's a little advice. Run for your life! Teaching someone who's not ready to serve medicine is like giving a weapon to a child, or even worse, to a child that believes that they are an adult. It is a huge responsibility. I so wish I would have been guided better and I'm hoping that with this video, maybe at least a few of these cases will be prevented. But I also want to say that I am really proud of my students, as they have become incredible people and facilitators. And it is so beautiful to see them develop their own unique gifts and shine their light so bright. Number seven, give too much power to the medicine. This is one of the most common mistakes made by almost every facilitator. To believe that ayahuasca will do everything for you, that she can heal it all, that this is the only solution for everyone's problems. That one should get on their knees and praise her at all times. That she is the indisputable goddess of all goddesses in the history of the universe. One of the reasons why this is such a common mistake is because the experience can be so powerful and impactful and it can do so much for oneself that we can naturally become very fascinated with it. That fascination is based on how much one can change because of it the incredible impact that this can have in one's life, and also the fact that many people who couldn't get over a specific trauma or mental disease, who have been trying for 20 years to heal it with almost every methodology available, including pharmaceuticals and therapy and other healing modalities, finally heal it with ayahuasca. This naturally creates fascination, but that fascination is a thing that can blind us to the reality of how healing really works and what this medicine really does. That fascination can make people become really ungrounded. An example of ungrounded lexicon is everything I just said about ayahuasca being this almighty being. And then people that carry that fascination will have a higher chance of becoming facilitators for obvious reasons. Those reasons are that that fascination is going to bring them to spend more time with it, drink it more often, get to know many other facilitators, and eventually bring the desire within them to become a facilitator themselves. That fascination is carried and then taught to others. So not only the experience itself can create that fascination, but the fact that our teachers teach us exactly that, to become fascinated with it, does not help at all. It doubles down on the idea of her being the solution for all of the world's problems. I made that mistake too. At that point, anybody who would talk to me about any issue, I would tell them that the solution was ayahuasca. Kidney problems? Ayahuasca. Cancer? Ayahuasca. The mafia is making you an offer that you can't refuse? <sniffs> Ayahuasca. What about nightmares about Mickey Mouse taking over the world? <laughs> Duh, Ayahuasca, of course. Another problem this creates, which I see in a lot of ceremonies, is that because of the belief that Ayahuasca will be doing all of the work, then the facilitator diffuses a lot of their own responsibility. For example, a facilitator can say, well, you had to go through that experience to work on your karma or whatever it is that you're dealing with. And even though that isn't necessarily untrue, meaning it could be true that we're working through our karma and that is why we're going through the things we go through, what makes it untrue is that that's not the thing to say because it's being used to not take responsibility for the parts that are up to the facilitator to assist the person in the many ways that they can be assisted without the need for medicine. Now, this does not mean that ayahuasca does not have the capacity to help heal so many issues, including those that I was mocking. She does, and this is why one can become so passionate and fascinated with her. It can help with cancer, it can help with kidney problems, and yes, it can help with your nightmares about Mr. Mouse taking over the world. It can help with anxiety, depression, and almost any mental issue. 
The key word here is can. It also might not, and that depends on the person, their capacity to open, their capacity to heal, where they are at in their healing journey, and the capacity of the facilitator to play their part where ayahuasca didn't, which for some people is very little and for some others is a lot. Some people won't need their facilitator at all. Ayahuasca will do most or even all of it. Some others will not feel that the experience was that profound and will depend mostly on their facilitator. The facilitator basically is there to pick up all the slack that ayahuasca leaves, which in some cases can be a lot. So there should always be space for the idea that ayahuasca might not be that thing that every facilitator prays so religiously. Sometimes she is, and some other times she's not. Number six, doing the thing that made me feel the most valued instead of the thing that was the most in service of the space. Part of the wounding that I brought to this work was my complete lack of self-confidence stemming from my times in elementary school. I was always the skinniest kid in the classroom and, of course, the most prone to being bullied, and this created an array of different wounds. As we have talked in this channel many times before, a wound is an empty space in your emotional body craving for the thing that it didn't get. Everyone wanted to be friends with the bullies and all the girls liked them. Since I was the opposite of a bully, then my thought process went something like this. Everyone wants to be friends or date the bullies. I am the opposite of a bully. Therefore, no one wants to be my friend or date me. One of the many ones created through this was I am not worthy of admiration or I am not amazing. The bullies are. So what will these empty spaces in my emotional body will be craving? I want to be admired and I want to feel that I am amazing. Or maybe even truer, I want others to think that I am amazing. And that is one of the wounds that I brought to this work, unconsciously of course. But one of my shadowed reasons to serve medicine was for people to admire me or for them to think that I was amazing. I learned to talk powerfully, I learned to inspire people, I learned to help people heal, I learned to make them cry through knowledge and wisdom, I learned to lead beautiful meditations. And even though that's awesome, part of why I learned all of that was wounded based so that they could admire me and for them to think that I was amazing. This is a great example of how our wounds bring upon our gifts, but our wounds need to heal, otherwise we will be giving our gifts stained with our wounds. A great example of how we can be giving our gifts stained with our wounds if we don't heal them was when, back then, I always used to finish a ceremony with a meditation. Now, the meditation had to be there and had to be a part of every ceremony's ending. It was essential and could not be missing. If you would have asked me why, back then I would have said that this meditation helped bring the ceremony to a full conclusion and allowed people to go home feeling in the best possible way. Was that true? For the most part, yes. People cried a lot and left the ceremony feeling much better than without the meditation. But people living in a better state was part of the reason of why it was essential for me to lead a meditation at the end of a ceremony. We can call that the light reason. There was a shadowed reason in there too, and I was unaware of it. And that was that it was essential for me to make people cry out of joy and inspire them with a meditation so that they would think that I was amazing. <laughs> there is a friend of mine, the one who brought this to my attention back then, that I am sure is having a blast watching this right now. That's okay, you can laugh, you can enjoy it, you totally earned it. I have to say, it is a little bit vulnerable to share all of this, but it is also okay, I am past that stage. I've done a lot of healing around that, and I don't need for people to think anything in particular of me anymore. And that is honestly a big relief. Healing, man, so important. Now the consequences of leading a meditation out of wanting for people to think I was amazing are the same consequences of doing anything out of a wound, no matter if the meditation was great or not. And that is, that part is connected to my own needs instead of the needs of others in that moment. For example, sometimes a meditation was not needed, or sometimes it would help some, but if somebody else was struggling, what they needed was personal attention and not a meditation. And sometimes a person would be in a specific state where sitting for 20 minutes straight would make them feel worse, but I wouldn't notice any of that because that was not where my focus was. I hope you can see now how giving a gift from a wounded place can actually spoil the gift. So I will say it one more time, healing man, it's so important. Now, before we finish today's video, I would like to ask you a very simple question. What does it feel to hear someone else expose their vulnerable parts? I will give you a few seconds. By opening up in this way, I'm hoping that you'll notice that it is okay to do so, 
and help my viewers know that when we become vulnerable, what others think of us tends to be the opposite of what we fear they'll think. We think people are going to see us through critical eyes, basically through the same eyes of shame that we see ourselves in those places that are hard for us to share. Instead, most people tend to look at us through compassionate eyes that say, good job for being brave to share a tender part of you. So if that's what you felt about me sharing this, know that this is what most people are going to feel about you when you share your own tender parts, even if it feels like the opposite is true. And when that happens, a part of you automatically heals by owning an abandoned part of you that was hiding behind the shame. That ownership helps for some of that shame to be released, bringing an inner sense of lightness and freedom. And for the few cases in which you will be met with critical eyes, know that that's when healing plays a big part of it. For example, if you have been seeing me with critical eyes, I would say that's mostly on you. I'm okay, I feel okay, and I basically don't care because I've done the healing around it. If you would like to receive the summary of this video, it is now available in a cutely made PDF so that you can revisit the topics presented here and refresh your memory anytime you want. If you would like to get it, check the link in the description below. Thank you for listening and for your interest in healing. It is essential that each one of us keep doing our own to live in the kind of world that our hearts desire to live in. It is possible. We just need to keep healing. Today I presented mistakes 10 to 6. Stay tuned for part 2 of this video where I will be exposing my even worse mistakes. If you would like to support the channel, on your way out you can click the like button and subscribe to it so that you don't miss any of my content. And I will see you in next week's video. Bye! Click on the left square to watch another video I made on a related topic. All my content is free. If you appreciate it and wish to assist me to continue releasing this kind of content, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You can also follow me on my socials and subscribe to this channel.